Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, I'm Joe Trotter. I'm the director of the Center for African American Urban Studies and the Economy, better known as CAUSE. And I want to welcome you to the third speaker in the spring portion of our CAUSE Hands Lecture Series. This is a special series for us because it's about reparation. And over the last two and a half years, we've been involved in an A.W. Mellon funded project uh, on reparations involving 10 other institutions around the country. I'm especially grateful uh, to the Heinz College uh, for its support of this series and its willingness to come on board as a partner uh, with this particular round of lecturers. Before we get started with our speaker, as always, I'd like to thank a number of people who helped to make this particular series possible. Uh, one of these, and most, in, in many ways, most important, we want to thank the audience. Uh, those of you who come out to witness these lectures on a regular basis, you represent the real reason that we carry out this series. And we're especially grateful for the community members who come out because this series is designed to connect Carnegie Mellon University and the local community in which it is located. Over the last couple of months, <laughs> CAUSE has had to uh, find a new program coordinator. We finally found a new program coordinator who will come on board on Monday. His name is uh, Ollie uh, Chips. Uh, so we're happy about that. But what I wanna do now is to thank those people who helped us to stay afloat. <laughs> over the last uh, two months in the absence of our program coordinator. I especially wish to thank Natalie Taylor, our business manager, and Victoria Donahoe. Victoria, would you stand and do Okay, <laughs> thank you. They have been a mainstay in getting our posters ready, getting the mailings out to our uh, mailing list, and in general, arranging travel for our speakers. Uh, so we are very grateful to you uh, for your help. Before we get started, I also wanna say that uh, the university as a whole has been very supportive of the CAUSE initiatives. Um, from our department head, Nico State, Nico, would you raise your hand? Nico State has been an extraordinary supporter of the CAUSE uh, program. And in addition to NICO, we have the support of the dean, the provost and the president of this university. Uh, president Johanian, we're happy to report, has signed on for another five years uh, to lead Carnegie Mellon University. And he has been a real stellar supporter of our work uh, over the years. There's another set of people I want to acknowledge tonight before we go to the speaker, and I'll go there uh, instantly. Uh, we have a number of people here who are part of our A.W. Mellon Pittsburgh Democratic Futures team. Uh, I want to acknowledge Esther Bush, um, Carla, let's see, where is Carla? Carla Young and Patricia Mitchell. They are here with us uh, tonight, so thank you. Uh, for being here. So at this point, I will make one other uh, comment, and I just want to make everybody aware <laughs> that in 2023, the Urban History Association will meet in Pittsburgh, and it will meet on the question of reparation and global perspective. And I'd just like to keep calling your attention to that meeting and hoping that you will sign up uh, to go to the, some of the lectures and panels uh, on that occasion. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Goldstein. We're delighted 
to have Brian talk to us today. Brian is an associate professor at Swarthmore College. He is a specialist in, 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 in architectural and urban history. He teaches a wide range of courses on the history of architecture and urbanism, on modern architecture and urban planning, and on race and the American built environment. He has also generously shared his research in a variety of academic, professional, and public forums. He received his MA, BA, and PhD degrees from Harvard University. Building upon his extraordinary intellectual and academic background and experiences, he is an innovative scholar. His contributions to scholarship include articles in the major journals in his field, including the Journal of Urban History, the Journal of American History, and the influential architectural journal, Buildings and Landscapes, to name a few. But his most influential research and publications include the first and now revised and enlarged second edition of his groundbreaking book, The Roots of Urban Renaissance, Gentrification and the Struggle Over Harlem, published by Harvard University Press in, 1917, in uh, 2017. I don't want to put you back in the 20, <laughs> 2017. <laughs> um, but he has also a new edition of that book, uh, published by Princeton University Press, 2023. The Roots of Urban Renaissance is an amazing accomplishment. It received the 2019 Lewis Mumford Prize for the best book in planning history. A year later, it also received the John Friedman Book Award from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. Professor Goldstein is currently writing a biography of the African-American architect, J. Max Bond. This book is also currently under contract with Princeton University Press. The title of that book, at least the current title, if architecture were for people, colon, the life and work of J. Max Bond. I think we want to hear a little bit about that in the Q&A today. If architecture were for people, and we'll, we'll hold that for the conversation. On a personal note, uh, I would just like to share with you that a couple of years ago, my graduate seminar read Brian's first book. We were impressed by the power of Brian's portrait of changes that transpired in Harlem from the civil rights and black power eras through the opening years of the 21st century. Brian's book helped us to see a whole world changing before our eyes. I wanna quote and partly paraphrase something from that book. On the last night of June, 1969, grassroots activists blocked the construction of a new skyscraper on a cleared lot at the Northwest corner of Harlem's Lenox Avenue and 125th Street. You know, people from my generation remember Malcolm <laughs> and those street intersections. Malcolm was identified 
quite a bit with those trees. And yet, this, even though these activists were able to block uh, the early effort, as Brian put it, to sort of reclaim Harlem for the post-industrial economy or post-industrial capitalism, for a moment, it seems that they succeeded in a real way. But 40, 40 years later, on the same site, Brian calls attention to what is called the Harlem Center. Quote, soaring 10 stories above 125th Street, encased in brick, steel, and glass. This was Harlem's newest shopping center, complete with the Marshalls, Staples, and CVS. Now, many of us, we lament that these African-American communities were displaced by these corporate giants. But in Brian's book, he makes the argument that we shouldn't see this as simply a, a victory for post-industrial capitalism that black people in Harlem had mobilized grassroots movements in order to shape the new city. And so today we wanna hear more from Brian Goldstein because since he completed and published that book in 2017, he's been doing a lot of thinking about this issue and where we stand today. I think he's in an excellent position to discuss what he has learned and what we should know moving forward in the first, it's like to the, to the end of the first quarter of the 21st century. It's amazing that we'll, two years away from the end of the first quarter of the 21st century. So without further delay, let us welcome Professor Goldstein and his lecture, Gentrification and the Struggle Over the Post-Industrial City, The View from Harlem. Can, I, can everyone see slides okay? Do I don't know if we should dim lights a little. What do you think, Victoria? I think it'll help a little. And I'm, I'm pretty loud, so I'm just gonna move the microphone a little bit back. But if you can't hear me, tell me, please. Of course. Is there maybe our better option? I think that's okay, yeah. And yeah, you can still see them on the video, perfect. Just going to try advancing and make sure we're good. Okay, great. Well, um, first of all, um, thank you for the very generous introduction. I'm not a person of tall stature, but I think I'm standing a little bit taller after that. It was very generous and, and meant a lot to me. I want to thank you for welcoming me, uh, Professor Trotter. I especially want to express my gratitude to you, um, to the Center for uh, African American Urban Studies and the Economy, Heinz College, and the Department of History for inviting me for arranging my visit. Victoria, it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you for helping me. Um, thank you to the audience um, from the uh, Carnegie Mellon community, from the broader Pittsburgh community, and to the folks watching um, online. Thank you as well for joining us. Um, you've had amazing guests as part of the Cause Heinz speaker series over the last academic year. I'm very honored to be among them. My talk today will center on my research on the New York City neighborhood of Harlem, as Professor Trotter alluded, um, and especially um, from my book, The Roots of Urban Renaissance, Gentrification and the Struggle Over Harlem. And your uh, preview is helpful because I'm actually going to focus on the story that you broadly outlined, but I'll get much into, more into the details of that. And as, um, as you heard, I would be happy to sort of think through some of these questions with you um, as well, uh, especially during the, the question and answer. 
Um, I'll begin with the eminent sociologist Kenneth Clark in the year 1965 as he gazed upon Harlem, the neighborhood um, where he had long lived. His take was not positive. Here's Clark. The most concrete fact of the ghetto is its physical ugliness, the dirt, the filth, the neglect. In many stores, walls are unpainted, windows are unwashed, service is poor, supplies are meager, the parks are seedy with lack of care, the streets are crowded with the people and refuse. There are only five libraries, but hundreds of bars, hundreds of churches, and scores of fortune tellers. Everywhere there are signs of fantasy, decay, abandonment, and defeat. People seem to have given up in the little things that are so often the symbol of the larger things. Clark was writing in his classic book, Dark Ghetto, a kind of a canonical work of American sociology. The book um, largely focused on Harlem, the most famous African-American neighborhood in the United States, which ran from the Harlem River to the Hudson River from around 110th Street up to around 155th Street in Manhattan. The title of the book, Dark Ghetto, suggests what Clark saw there. And I wanna emphasize it's what he saw there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's what others would have seen there, but it was what he, uh, you know, the picture he painted through his point of view. And that was a story of despair, of deterioration, of decline um, that touched the community's buildings and people. Clark um, was hardly alone in this assessment. Photographer Gordon Parks painted much the same portrait a few years later in his famous Life magazine essay, A Harlem Family. Parks depicted the hunger, poverty, and violence that daily haunted the Fontenelle family, his subject. His image of their apartment building um, shown in shadow with only the glow of a sign advertising, two signs actually advertising liquors, um, suggests that Parks may have used a different medium but certainly did not contest Clark's conclusions. Yet 40 years later, the most notable sign glowing over Harlem was not that of a liquor store. It was that of the refurbished marquee of the Apollo Theater. Nearby stood new shopping centers whose palette was not the opaque brick of the Fontenelle's tenement building, but glass and steel that showed a hive of activity inside. On Harlem streets, new middle-class residents were refurbishing brownstones, shopping at boutiques, dining in fashionable restaurants, Harlem's population had approached 600,000 in 1950 before beginning a decades long descent, eventually bottoming out at 334,000 in 1990. But by 2010, the neighborhood had added 45,000 residents who were buying and restoring the community's historic buildings. That year, median household income uh, in central Harlem had reached over $35,000 a number that may not sound large on first um, hearing, but it was uh, it represented an inflation adjusted growth of 250% since 1950. This physical and social transformation became so undeniable that it even earned its own nickname, one that referred back to Harlem's early 20th century heyday. This was called the neighborhood's second renaissance. Harlem's transformation was more than a local story. It also came to symbolize a national one that saw many urban centers transform from America's mid-century urban crisis to what came to be known more broadly as its urban renaissance. The late 1960s saw civil disorder become a frequent summer occurrence in places like Detroit, Newark, Washington, DC. In 1968, the National Commission on Urban Problems reached a bleak conclusion about American cities. Quote, after our inspections, hearings, and research studies, we found conditions much worse, more widespread, and more explosive than any of us had thought, unquote. Yet by the 1990s, reporters sang a different tune. As CNN reported in one story, cities were hot again. Rather than a scapegoat for the country's problems, cities became the very image of cool in TV sitcoms. Uh, they became, as you see on the right here, uh, the inspiration for new suburban developments that were made to look like downtown streets. By the early 2000s, the idea of a full on back to the city movement seemed entirely convincing. Among observers, this came to be known as gentrification, uh, a process of physical and social change that saw increasing wealth among urban residents and the arrival of new businesses to serve those residents. Yet if we accept such transformation is undeniable in places like New York, Cincinnati, Oakland, and certainly Pittsburgh too, the question remains what brought it about. Scholars and journalists pointed to Harlem's connection to a transnational network 
of capital and ideas, which turned places like New York into global cities, as one scholar called them. The rise of the finance, insurance, and real estate sectors, the fire economy brought new wealth, prompting workers to select homes close to their center city jobs. Many of those new urbanites likewise responded to a cultural vogue that celebrated urban places, that celebrated uh, affordable historic buildings, that celebrated walkable streets. Um, yet, as I'll argue today and in the roots of urban renaissance, um, these factors, while important, are not enough to explain the changes to Harlem streets. While forces like globalization and new preferences for urban places certainly were at play, those accounts purposely or inadvertently ignore the residents who already lived in places like Harlem. A deeper look reveals that gentrification was never simply a process that happened to such residents. Rather, Harlemites themselves played a crucial role in bringing about an urban renaissance on their streets. Even amid declining population, residents remained deeply invested in Harlem, inhabiting, reimagining, and rebuilding the neighborhood. And as a result, they wrought dramatic changes, including the arrival of wealthier neighbors and the increasing presence of national retail chains. In other words, Harlemites were not simply spectators to this process, but participants. As I'll explain, this was both an unintended and intended consequence of a history with very deep roots. It was unintended because as Harlemites sought control over the future of development in their community, they shaped new kinds of organizations to achieve that goal. Over time, those organizations came to pursue different objectives than those that had once motivated them. At the same time, Harlem's gentrification was also an intended consequence. Harlemites were a diverse group. They held varying ambitions for their community, while some saw the path to revival in its existing residents, um, others sought to bring new residents to its streets and rejoin what they saw as the economic mainstream. So kind of two methodological points that I just will kind of highlight here. One is that to tell the history of Harlem, you actually have to tell the history of people who live there, which is not typically the uh, frequent point of view of gentrification histories. And secondly, understand that the people who live there weren't all the same, that there actually were different points of view within that group of people. In a relatively brief exploration today, I want to emphasize that painting a portrait of gentrification from the grassroots provides a much more complex depiction than most people imagine when they hear that word. Gentrification could be a very turbulent process, a violent process, one that raised rents, that drove out longstanding businesses and residents. As a result, accounts are often pitched in these very simple terms, winners and losers, outsiders and insiders, good and evil. Harlem's story shows that this history was never so simple and communities like this one prove impossible to paint with a broad brush. Harlemites had different ideas of what they wanted for Harlem and in debating those ideas, they achieved a result that could be both beneficial and harmful. I'll tell this um, story not by focusing on Harlem's hundreds of blocks, which would be a very long lecture, um, but paradoxically, by emphasizing only one, the one that you've already uh, had a little bit of a preview to. Harlem's central block stands on the north side of 125th Street between Lenox and 7th Avenues at the approximate midpoint of the neighborhood's main street, 125th Street. Throughout Harlem's history, this served as the center of the community's public sphere. It was the home to storied bookstores, um, that defined Harlem as a locus of African-American thought. You can see one of them here, the House of Common Sense and the home of proper propaganda, Michaud's bookstore, uh, where you could buy a book but get an ed education. Um, also, it was the backdrop to a Harlem Speaker's Corner that hosted everyone from Ghanaian President Kwame Nkrumah to, as you see here, civil rights leader Malcolm X. Over decades, this block would uniquely symbolize the transformation that I've described. It became a site of constant reimagination and reconstruction as Harlem moved from urban crisis to urban renaissance. To show this today, um, I'll focus on three key moments in the history of this single block and three different visions for the neighborhood, uh, both built and unbuilt, that unfolded here over 40 years. And by looking closely at those visions, and nodding to the broader story they tell, um, I hope I can convey the very local roots of Harlem's second renaissance. The first of these visions took place in the summer of 1969. 
And it's depicted here in a photo that on first glance might not look like much. We see a large windswept site. But looking closer, you'll see a green and white striped tent, the flag in the foreground, smaller tents to its left and right, simple wooden structures and people scattered here and there. As this suggests, people were living on this site and it was not just any site, it was the site, the block where Malcolm X had spoken in 1963. Malcolm X, of course, is nowhere to be found here, um, nor was the bookstore that provided his backdrop, nor any of the other buildings on the block. They had recently been demolished, wiping Harlem's central block clean. But the cleared block did not remain empty for long. As you already heard, on June 30th, 1969, at night, young Harlemites moved onto it illegally. They cut the fence, they passed through, they gave it a new name, Reclamation Site Number 1. Reclamation Site Number 1 is our first stop today because it symbolizes a moment when Harlemites demanded control over the future of their community. They insisted that it should be rebuilt both by and for its existing residents. They contended that outsiders were not necessary for revitalization. We see this in the very name, Reclamation. The act of reclaiming, suggesting, of course, that something is being reclaimed. And number one, suggesting that it was the first such transformation, such reclamation. You might be asking, reclaimed from what exactly? For much of the post-World War II period, Harlem had been the site of an intense process of government-led redevelopment known as urban renewal. Urban renewal rebuilt American cities at a time when the middle class was fleeing to the suburbs. I don't need to tell you too much about urban renewal because Pittsburgh was certainly one of its most avid proponents, but still a bit of background for those who may not know the history. In an effort to keep cities competitive, government officials subsidized the purchase and clearance of vast tracts of urban land to be redeveloped by public and private interests, often for uses that were intended to bring the middle class back to the city. Housing was one such use, Another is the famous example that you see in this before and after juxtaposition, Lincoln Center, New York's vaunted performing arts complex, which is one of the more famous outcomes of this policy regime. I suppose if we put ourselves in the, foot, the footprints of a mayor who's seeing their uh, population and tax base leave, we might be able to understand how this represented a sort of rational response to post-war circumstances, but that doesn't um, uh, contradict the fact that urban renewal frequently had extremely harmful effects. Um, the areas targeted for clearance were not equal. They very frequently, um, very disproportionately impacted low-income people of color. Harlem was no exception. By the mid-1960s, hundreds of its acres had been turned to middle-class housing. Um, had been used to support the expansion of neighborhood institutions or neighboring institutions, universities, seminaries, or for public housing that was to be the destination of the displaced. Understandably, um, those uprooted by this approach grew, fr uh, grew frustrated with its human costs and also with their lack of control. Such frustration intersected with the ongoing civil rights movement. Civil rights activists famously demanded voting rights, desegregated schools and housing, um, access to public accommodations. By the late 1960s, many younger activists had grown frustrated with those demands, which seemed too gradual, often ineffective in the face of violent resistance. They offered a more radical approach to civil rights known as the Black Power Movement. Black power activists argued that instead of seeking to diminish majority minority neighborhoods through integration, African-Americans should see their neighborhoods as centers of power and demand self-determination. And specifically, they shaped an idea called community control, a notion that Black Americans should have control over the institutions in their communities, including schools and political representation. Maybe a little bit less heard in conversations about the history of Black power, is that they also demanded control over development. Urban renewal is mentioned in Stokely Carmichael and Charles V. Hamilton's uh, seminal text, Black Power, as one of the examples of the ways that communities did not have uh, autonomy. And we should understand opposition to urban renewal in that lens. So this is one reason why I love 
this slide, an architectural historian stands before you uh, who insists on the need to think about civil rights in the history of architecture. And here we have Stokely Carmichael called the architect of black power uh, in ebony. Of course, a, a pun, but still I'll run with it. It was in this context that reclamation site number one rose as an architectural symbol of this idea. In the mid 1960s, New York State had announced plans to demolish Harlem Central Block in order to build a modern 23-story skyscraper state office building. Many Harlemites had once supported the project, seeing it as a route to needed jobs and investment. And I do want to emphasize that idea that there was a, a kind of strong middle-class, politically moderate voice in support of urban renewal that were made up of Harlemites, of civil rights leaders. But in the Black Power era, this project threatened growing demands for community control. Opponents contended that this would be the first step in a larger takeover of Harlem. First, the state's building would rise, then Harlem would slip into the hands of outsiders, typically cast as wealthy white people. Faced with a state office building proposal that they saw as an existential threat, young radical Harlemites, calling themselves the Community Coalition, staged a different sort of redevelopment to reclaim the site. Their arrival here in June 1969, numbering about 200 in all, began an effort to stop the state's building, but also to shape the site to their ideal vision of Harlem. Unlike the state, which favored the middle class, they emphasized the value of Harlem's present inhabitants as the foundation for development. Here's the community coalition, and I quote, we intend to see to it that the primary concern in all redevelopment design designs for Harlem is for the human beings who live here now. To bring this about, they modeled a self-determined approach to design and construction at reclamation site number one, one that turned modern redevelopment on its head. Unlike the state's austere modernist tower, this involved an informality that reflected the democratic process reshaping the site. Activists erected five tents, one is a field kitchen, and raised their red, black, and green flag, a visual reminder of their radical ideals. As one occupier explained, quote, red for the blood we have shed, black for our blackness, and green for our land, which we are demanding, unquote. Others inhabited an old bus on the site, the large green and white striped tent, self-built wooden structures. Embodying the idea that this should serve Harlemites first, they turned the program towards the needs of inhabitants and neighbors, many living in poverty, with re resources on site, such as a health clinic and a daycare. This community, which one reporter described, I should even say complimented, because it was meant that way, as a tent and shanty liberation town, functioned as a carefully designed cooperative enterprise. As occupiers explained, quote, we are being fed, clothed, sheltered, protected, and generally supported by thousands of people in the community, unquote. They shared responsibilities on site. Mealtime was a telling example. Each day, occupants cooked a meal over an outdoor fire, free to anyone who wanted to come to the site and dine. Um, frequent events, including festivals, rallies, political seminars, readings, performances by people like um, Amiri Baraka, the um, jazz drummer Milford Graves on site, restored the block's role as the center of Harlem's public sphere. Though the few existing images cannot give us a full picture of life on the site in the summer of 1969, they suggest a place where spatial transformation played a crucial part in enacting the goals of community control. This was a space centered on the everyday life of Harlemites, a place that served both a symbolic and literal role as the people's redevelopment. It traced a vision of community built, community serving redevelopment as an alternative to the government's disruptive planning approach. Site occupants intended their temporary settlement to be the foundation for a more permanent proposal determined by Harlemites. They often asked neighbors, quote, what would you like to see on this land, unquote. To answer this question, they collaborated with like-minded architects who shaped three schemes that would form the basis of a community conversation about the future of reclamation site number one all departed dramatically from the state office building in their focus on mixed uses and community needs. And you might be looking at these images and saying, you know, architecturally these don't look that different 
from the state office building. And there, I would read new, some nuance into it if we wanted to take the time to look at them later. But we would also say that very much a lot of this was about program. It was about um, use. It was about function more than it was about physical appearance. It was about what buildings did more than what they looked like. The first of these um, included a black cultural center, um, offices, a uh, plaza for festivals, and a thousand low income housing units. The second included a high school, auditorium for public meetings, and 200 units of housing. Alongside offices, the third scheme also included educational facilities, social services, a gallery for black arts, and a theater. Reinforcing this is Harlem's democratic public space. Activists invited Harlemites to vote on these schemes in a community poll. Participants characterized the difference between their ideal and the state's plans in racialized terms. One reflected the vision of African-American residents, the other, the imposition of white outsiders. As the flyer says, you've got a choice to make now, black or white. Of the more than 6,000 Harlemites who voted in the poll, only 26 wanted the state's building. The overwhelming majority endorsed the community-oriented ideal of reclamation site number one, a vision that offered the radical idea that Harlem did not need outsiders to be revitalized, that residents could bring that transformation about. As a community coalition spokesman announced at the end of the poll, and I quote, the majority of Harlem residents, the poor, the overworked, the overlooked, do know and understand what they need. In the polls aftermath, activists insisted that the site's direction would determine the future of Harlem. Their settlement had offered a physical culmination of the radically democratized ideals of community control. Their wooden structures and tents opened up space to voice alternatives for Harlem's central block. The on-site referendum suggested the possibility of realizing self-determination. By September 1969, protesters could claim a vision for Harlem's future, the tools that they hoped would realize it, and physical evidence that their ideal could come true. Despite the intentions of reclamation site number one, however, the second vision that I'll examine for this block indicates that occupiers' highest aspirations would not come to be. While it proved relatively easy to imagine a radical redevelopment of these acres and even to begin to bring that about, a permanent realization of activist ambition would prove much harder to achieve. That becomes evident if we look at plans for the site that prevailed by the late 1970s. On the left stands the state office building. Despite activists' best efforts, the state succeeded in completing their project. On the right, we see its proposed neighbor, the Harlem International Trade Center. If reclamation site number one had symbolized the idea that Harlem's revitalization would consist of a radically democratic community serving redevelopment effort, the drawing here offers a very different idea. Specifically, the Harlem International Trade Center project symbolized a vision of redevelopment through big commercial ventures, dominant in their presence on 125th Street. Unlike the state's building, however, these were not to be led by outsiders, but by Harlemites also, but Harlemites whose ambition for development and its intended beneficiaries differed dramatically from that of reclamation site number one. So we might ask, how did plans for this block go from a tent and shanty liberation town to the Harlem International Trade Center in a mere decade? This outcome was the consequence of debates between Harlem's different factions at the community level during the 1970s, and specifically between Harlem's radicals and its political moderates. In particular, those debates unfolded within the walls of new organizations sparked by the dream of community control espoused by reclamation site number one. So this is a, a key point, so I'll repeat it. These debates over Harlem's uh, future unfolded within or new organizations that grew out of the dream of community control in the late 1960s. New community-based groups formed to pursue the ownership and development of Harlem's land. But these organizations and their goals became the centerpiece of conflicts over the proper course that Harlem should follow. Mirroring the shift from reclamation site number one to the Harlem International Trade Center, 
They transformed throughout the 1970s as Harlemites debated what exactly community control really meant. Despite radical origins in time, those organizations moderated their answer, leading by the 1980s, as we will see, to the kinds of projects that the Trade Center represented. This shift took place in several newly formed organizations, but I'll focus um, today on one especially revealing example, the Harlem Urban Development Corporation um, called HUDC. I'll refer to it as HUDC, the Harlem Urban Development Corporation, which I do write about at length in the, in the book. HUDC followed directly from activism at reclamation site number one. In September, 1969, New York's extremely powerful governor, Nelson Rockefeller, ordered the clearance of activist settlement, insisting that construction of the state office building begin. And as you can see from this image, that clearance proceeded forcefully, uh, removal of young radical protesters and the bulldozing of the structures that they had built. But the state proved eager to ease tensions in Harlem, in part by creating an autonomous organization that would enable Harlemites to shape their land. As much as the governor wanted the project to continue, there was also a recognition that something needed to be done differently here. And HUDC was supposed to help bring that about. It was politically and financially backed by the state, but it was explicitly intended to provide Harlemites with control over development to be run by Harlemites. The organization's initial focus was the block at the center of our story, especially the land around the state office building. Through HUDC, Harlemites were to determine the fate of this land, but they disagreed about both the role of the organization and the destiny of that acreage. In those conflicts, we see the larger transformation from the collective, broadly beneficial vision of Harlem's emergent radical activists to a much narrower vision that largely represented the interests of its established moderate power brokers. And just to explain the image, if you can't read it, um, this is in 1971, the state office building, which I didn't tell you the um, activists who are always smarter than the people they oppose called it the SOB, which is very funny. Um, but this is uh, the SOB 25% under construction. So showing you, of course, that this is happening. They, they did not stop that construction. Looking closely at HUDC shows that this transformation occurred as a result of two intersecting factors. The first was the intransigence of the very radical figures who had staked their claim at reclamation site number one. While the state led the removal of activists, the officials responsible for creating HUDC saw the inclusion of a radical viewpoint as essential to a successful broad-based organization and to the successful development of the block. To their great credit, the state wanted radicals to have a seat at the table, a meaningful seat at the table. State officials offered ideologically diverse Harlemites the right to determine both development on the block and the purpose of the state's skyscraper. The skyscraper uh, remained, of course, um, in the project. Everything else you see was, was gone. It was kind of you know, taken off the board and said, you know, let's let Harlem determine what's going to be here. As one state redevelopment official, Edward Logue, who's a kind of titan of urban renewal, which gives you a sense of how much uh, kind of times had changed, explained in his quote, the first matter is what is the present desire of the Harlem community with respect to the program for the balance of the site, unquote. Likewise, officials promised that the skyscraper could house only community-oriented functions like job training. Yet even as such offers seemed to meet radical activists' demand for development that catered to Harlemites, these activists refused to participate in HUDC. And if we had to name one reason for that refusal, we would look to the appearance and meaning of the state's building. While the state offered to transform the controversial towers program to align with the vision of reclamation site number one, it refused to abandon the monolithic structure itself. For officials, the building served as a symbol of their continued power in Harlem at a time when that power was under threat at a moment of crisis. But that very symbol suggested to radicals that the struggle for reclamation had not yet succeeded. Instead of a brokered negotiation, they demanded a neighborhood referendum to determine development of Harlem's central block, arguing that, quote, reclamation site number one 
should belong to the Harlem community and there should be no question about it, unquote. State officials refused to recognize such a referendum though. Radicals were principled in their idealism, but their refusal to compromise their demands was a strategic error. It had the opposite effect from what they had intended. It isolated them from HUDC's leadership and development activities, which would continue with or without them. State officials understood that Harlem was not made up of one community, but many. They sought to include those multiple communities. When young radicals refused to cooperate, though, in HUDC's early days, officials found partners elsewhere in Harlem. This speaks to the second factor that gave rise to the vision symbolized by the Harlem International Trade Center. Moderates in Harlem saw the formation of HUDC and debates over the exact meaning of this ambiguous term, community control, as an opportunity to increase their influence in the neighborhood. Moderates found an open door with the refusal of radicals to soften their demands. And with that refusal, Harlem moderates who had long been at the helm of neighborhood institutions like banks and churches and the newspaper offered their alliance to officials. Consequently, HUDC's board of directors, oops, gonna go back. Okay, consequently, HUDC's board of directors came almost wholly under moderate control. Like Harlem's young radicals, these moderates saw community control as development determined by Harlemites. They defined it the same way, but their conception focused on very different means and ends. Instead of democratic participation, they insisted on their own ability to speak for their neighbors. And instead of far reaching benefits, moderate leaders often embraced approaches that would increase their own power and their own resources. So they too were seeing Harlemites controlling and Harlemites benefiting, but their vision was a much narrower one, largely of themselves. The evolving plans um, for our familiar block best exemplified this. Amid early efforts to include activists, the state um, hired an architect who came from radical ranks to draft plans for the block. That architect, uh, Max Bond, of, as, of whom I am writing a longer study now, and his firm, Bond Rider Associates, traced a scheme that maintained the ambitions of reclamation site number one for community serving land uses, um, housing, education, cultural and political programming. But the moderates who came to control the rudder of HUDC showed little interest in those kinds of ideals. Instead, they pushed for development plans that were profit oriented and commercial in nature. When officials offered the state building as the space for Harlem oriented uses, um, they pushed back. They argued that those uses would um, diminish the revenue that the tower would generate. Similarly, on the adjacent land, they resisted proposals to build a range of community facilities and housing alongside commercial land uses. Max Bond's multi-use plan had formed the heart of the state's vision in 1970, but within two years, moderate board members had shrunk the plan to two things, a hotel and a convention center. Moderates supported overwhelmingly commercial plans because they had much to gain from them. In this way, we can say that their vision for the block was premised on benefiting Harlemites, but uh, again, a much narrower spectrum of Harlem through profitable development that would benefit its sponsors financially. A telling example came when HUDC sought proposals from developers for the block. After initially picking a winner, board members changed their mind insisting that they should also have a right to submit proposals too, despite the obvious conflict of interest involved in seeking to profit from the activities of the very organization that they led. And those efforts, if not illegal, and they weren't, they were fundamentally very self-interested. They were indicative of moderate leaders' understanding of community organizations as a potential means for personal gain. It would be too simplistic to say that such ambitions were purely the result of selfishness or corruption. Rather, they embodied a larger trend that saw community control reconceived as profit generating development that leaders paternalistically promised 
would eventually benefit the Harlem community. And HGDC was one of a kind in this, uh, or was, was one of a type, I should say, in this, uh, you know, there were, uh, there's a group called the Harlem Commonwealth Council that emerged at the same time, one of the first community development corporations in the United States, and follows almost the exact same path, this move from kind of radical roots to a paternalistic idea of what community development means. The risks of this approach are very clear. It kept power in the hands of Harlem's already powerful, it interpreted benefits only as financial benefits, and it relied on the goodwill of leaders to ensure broad distribution of any profits. The Harlem International Trade Center was the culmination of this specific vision of Harlem's development future, and also one that exemplified its risks. The Trade Center first proposed in the late 1970s was to include a hotel, conference center, and office tower dedicated to fostering trade between the US, African countries, and the Caribbean. Standing tall, it echoed the state office building in its modernist form, also in its approach. It was conceived far from the influence of the young activists who had demanded the right to shape this land. Indeed, this became a pet project of one of Harlem's most powerful moderates, Congressman Charlie Rangel who steered it into the hands of President Jimmy Carter. As a result, only a few Harlemites had a say in the direction of Harlem's central Bloc. That reliance on public financial support had its own dangers. When funding was available, a project like the Trade Center could take form, but such funding was not assured. And of course, Jimmy Carter was a one-term president, something many of us rue today, but the real politic of it meant that there was no more money. And of course, when there's no more money, the plans went to the back burner. This was the devil's bargain of the approach that dominated on 125th Street by the early 1980s. Rather than a broad-based vision, difficult to implement, but perhaps more sustainable, this one involved a few powerful insiders and a few generous outsiders who were fickle in their support. And as a result, Harlem was left with unrealized plans a large, mostly empty lot at its center and the sunset of the hard to achieve, but ultimately more self-reliant vision of those who had occupied reclamation site number one. This brings us to the third vision for Harlem Central Block. A large brick and glass tower rising above a row of chain retail and the state office building looming in the background. This is Harlem Center, which Professor Trotter mentioned earlier. As this suggests, while plans for Harlem International Trade Center went unrealized in the 1980s, by the end of the century, new development would indeed rise on this site. And this development would be commercial in nature too, though motivated by different ambitions than HUDC had voiced a couple of decades earlier. Harlem Center was an $80 million complex completed in 2003. In the tower, as you can probably guess, were offices for lease, and then, of course, the bottom was the retail floor with some of the retailers that you already heard about, CVS, Dunkin' Donuts, Verizon, somewhat ironically, Washington Mutual, which went under in the 2008 fiscal crisis, but still, it was there too. On first glance, a structure like this may not seem so remarkable. Similar projects rise on many urban sites. But when we remember that this was the very land that held activists' tents as reclamation site number one, we begin to understand the distance that Harlem's central block had traveled in only a few decades. In closing with this example, I want to emphasize that this did not represent an inversion of Harlemite's dream of controlling development. Rather, in many ways, it was an achievement of that dream of controlling development. But the distance between chain retail and low-income housing or a high school suggests the irony of that achievement, as well as the many costs and benefits that development of the site brought by the new millennium. Pages. Harlem Center rose with the decline of HUDC, the Harlem Urban Development Corporation in the 1990s. In many ways, HUDC's early contradictions brought its eventual downfall. On one hand, HUDC's reliance on public funding continued to be problematic. As the backing of Representative Charles Rangel suggested, HUDC became a stronghold of moderate Democrats in Harlem. 
But even in New York, democratic governance was not assured. In fact, 1994 saw the election of Republican George Pataki as New York's governor, part of the broader conservative wave that year. You might remember him as very unsuccessful 2020 presidential candidate, George Pataki. Pataki owed little to New York City voters. Um, they largely supported his opponent. He soon cut funding to the state's largest city and he transferred it to his base upstate. HUDC terminated in 1995 was among the victims. So was the proposed International Trade Center, which had continued to languish. On the other hand, issues of self-interest, which had bubbled up among HUDC leadership from the organization's earliest days persisted. When the new governor shut down HUDC, the state investigated the group's activities throughout its 25 year history. And despite the undeniably political nature of the shuttering of HUDC, the state found inarguable proof of endemic conflicts of interest, overbilling for services, poor record keeping, and unpaid taxes. And it's very understandable to be suspicious of an investigation by the Pataki, um, by the Pataki administration of a Democrat stronghold. But we know that this was a history that started early on and kind of got to uh, almost comic proportions. And just one example, the board of directors, longtime general counsel, had also served for years as a paid legal consultant to HUDC staff. In its final three years alone, he billed for over $600,000 in services, several times the amount allowed in his contract, and none of the services rendered were detailed in invoices. Those kinds of stories undermined the good that the organization had done, especially in building housing in Harlem, while raising serious concerns that made it very difficult to defend. But the dream of community control did not die with HUDC. A new generation of organizations emerged to assume that mantle. One in particular gained with HUDC's losses, the Abyssinian Development Corporation. In the 1980s, federal funding to cities severely declined. In that context, new kinds of community-based organizations formed to gather what funding remained from private sources, foundations, states, and local governments. Many were church-based. Abyssinian Development Corporation, for example, was associated with Harlem's most famous church, the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And that ch uh, church was seeking to address deteriorating conditions on surrounding blocks. Abyssinian success largely derived from the charismatic leadership of the church's minister, Reverend Calvin Butts III, who died um, just in October, a few months ago. Butts was a political pragmatist, not something that is not mentioned in the obituaries, much to my irritation, but one of his really interesting characteristics was that he was willing to pursue any political alliance that might allow his activities to grow, um, and that included the Abyssinian Development Corporation. Indeed, uh, Butts had declined to endorse any candidate in the race uh, for governor that Pataki won, and that proved to be a very fateful decision. The new governor saw a gateway to a new audience in Butts, whom he rewarded with a seat on the board of a new statewide development organization. And Butts, in turn, saw Pataki's support as the means through which Abyssinian could move to a new scale in its development activities. With the termination of the International Trade Center, Governor Pataki's administration moved to turn the land east of the state office building into a new commercial development. The state's conservative leaders touted private sector investment as the road to revitalization, arguing that Harlem was an untapped market with tremendous potential. But this vision was not only a conservative vision, and it was not only Pataki's vision. In fact, it largely mirrored the urban policy of the Clinton administration. And crucially, it also mirrored the ambitions of groups like Abyssinian and people like Calvin Butts, who, uh, which espoused a different idea of what it took to fix Harlem than had its predecessors. Specifically, groups like Abyssinian argued that Harlem was under-retailed. That was a term that they liked to use, under-retailed, and had suffered by its exclusion from what they described as the economic mainstream. Following ascendant thought in business circles, they shaped a vision focused on what economist Michael Porter called the competitive advantage of the inner city. Rather than tying future success to government investment, the theory of competitive advantage suggested that places like Harlem needed to tap their existing strengths. 
You may have never heard of the competitive advantage in a city, but I'll just say that for a very long time, Michael Porter was the most cited professor at Harvard, which tells you about how common this theory was among people who were thinking about theories of economic activity, which is a lot of people, even if it may not be you know, urban historians um, like me, this is a very influential idea and it became very common to think about it at this moment. So competitive advantage says places like Harlem need to tap their existing strengths. One of those strengths, the argument went, was a large base of consumers who were not presently being served by an adequate number of stores. And in particular, for neighborhoods like Harlem, Michael Porter touted chain retail. Chain retail comes with a concept and product. It comes with training and it comes with capital. Like its predecessors in the 1970s, this vision uh, prioritized commercial development, but not as a means to benefit only the few Harlemites who would reap profits. Instead, the theory of, community, of um, competitive advantage argued that rejoining the economic mainstream was a means for broad improvement in Harlem. The ascendance of this view opened the door for like-minded community-based organizations to jump into development at a new scale. And here, the personal history of Abyssinian, Reverend Butts and Governor Pataki um, proved essential. When the state sought proposals to develop the long empty land east of the state office building, Abyssinians submitted their proposal for Harlem Center in partnership with Forest City Ratner, one of the largest developers at the time in New York City. And if the state did not design the project specifically for Abyssinian, no doubt the political capital that Butts had built paid dividends. When officials selected Abyssinian's proposal in 1997, nobody wondered why. As Congressman Rangel explained, quote, you support somebody and they support you, unquote. Projects like Harlem Center had roots in Abyssinian's development philosophy and political pragmatism, but also grew from the organization's broader efforts to promote the goal of economic integration in Harlem. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Abyssinian's reputation had grown as it ambitiously pursued housing development for low and moderate income residents, but also eagerly sought to bring the middle class back to Harlem. In projects like the one you see here called West 131 Plaza, which was completed in 1993, uh, which had 36 market priced condominiums, Abyssinian worked to change Harlem's population. Though some viewed more affluent neighbors as a threat, groups like Abyssinian saw a mixed income population as the solution to Harlem's problems of entrenched poverty. Just as they later argued that Harlem needed to rejoin broader economic markets, they contended that Harlem needed residents of many incomes to create economic stability. This was a vision of economic diversification of mixed income as an intrinsic good, even a, a panacea, a cure-all, a belief that was informed by their reading of emergent sociological thought, especially that of uh, the sociologist William Julius Wilson, another one of the most cited scholars of this era. Wilson basically argued that concentrations of poverty exacerbate the effects of poverty. And a lot of policy people read that is to solve poverty, we need to lessen the concentration of poverty. And Wilson himself said, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying, but that is how a lot of policymakers implemented it. You can see that in examples like this. These community level efforts laid a foundation for Harlem Center by bringing in to the neighborhood more residents who had more means. That was the fact that the state acknowledged explicitly in requesting proposals for the project. Harlem has more consumers who can shop at stores like this. A population of growing affluence fueled retail development beyond Harlem Center too, likewise involving community groups that saw their tasks as rejoining Harlem to the perceived economic mainstream. Other Harlem organizations took part in building Harlem USA, the neighborhood's first shopping mall, and in constructing the first supermarket on 125th Street, and for all intents, the first supermarket in Harlem really ever, but certainly for decades, um, which was a path mark. Though all featured national retailers, all were also built on a foundation of community development that claimed direct and indirect origins in the movement for community control that had once shaped reclamation site number one. By the new millennium then, physical evidence throughout Harlem proved that Harlemites had achieved a central role in urban development. It was undeniable that these groups had a role in urban development because they were building things like this. 
At the same time, few could agree on the ultimate meaning of that role as Harlem began to change quickly, dramatically, and often very turbulently. As 125th Street transformed physically and socially throughout the early 2000s, it became a symbol of the concept of gentrification. In 2003, the New York Times wrote of, quote, a new Harlem gentry in search of its latte, unquote, as it chronicled the life of residents for whom it was ever easier to find a salon, a bistro, or indeed a latte at a cafe. With sites like Harlem Center reaching completion, private developers jumped in with two feet, adding residential and commercial projects, both large and small. By the mid 2000s, one could buy a brownstone for several million dollars, even one needing a lot of repairs and could shop at Foot Locker, H&M, or American Apparel of just feet from the land that had once been reclamation site number one. Yet in describing a place that had traveled far from the community that Kenneth Clark had once depicted as, uh, in his words, a dark ghetto, it is crucial that we remember that as Harlem grew more affluent, more renovated and built up, and more commercially similar to other New York neighborhoods, the impetus was not simply others telling Harlem what to do. Community organizations with deep roots played a central role in bringing about these changes. If their ambitions uh, differed substantially in the 1990s from what they had been in the 1960s, they were no less tied to demands and debates at the community level, all of which were symbolically visible upon Harlem's central block. That Harlemites had a major hand in the story suggests that gentrification cannot be understood simply as a tale of outsiders exploiting insiders or of good innocent people and evil people. Rather, Harlem was never only one community and Harlemites rarely agreed on what they wanted their community to be. As a result, the balance sheet is far from clear with both costs and benefits as outcomes of these developments. Many residents regarded Harlem's changing face with optimism. They were excited about what they could buy close to home. They were encouraged by the physical reconstruction of their blocks. Their excitement could be seen even with something as simple, but uh, also very profound, like groceries. As one Harlemite explained in finally being able to shop at a supermarket in her neighborhood, quote, I'm just going crazy in here. Everything I need in a store is right here, unquote, which when you consider the world before Pathmark, where you could buy, you know, crummy meat, rotten meat, bad vegetables, um, and pay too much for them at, a, you know, a corner store, you can understand where this person is coming from. At the same time, others looked with disquiet upon a neighborhood changing physically, racially, and economically. Integration into broader economic markets came with real costs including the fear that transformation would go too far. Again, food was instructive as a different resident reflected on the changing items in her aisles. And I quote, the bodegas are gone. There's large delis now. What had been two for $1 is now one for $3. The food's being sold, feta cheese instead of sharp cheddar cheese. That's a whole other world. In broccoli and fresh meat, feta cheese and cheddar cheese, Harlemites captured the gains and losses, the hopes and fears that came with the changing neighborhood sparked by the actions of its residents. And far from ebbing, these changes would only continue at an ever greater pace and scale. Indeed, to see this today, one need only return to a block that over decades had held tents and wooden shelters, a state office building, plans for an ambitious international trade center and a shopping center. Standing before this site, one can easily look across 125th Street. There on a lot that had long sat empty, yet another shopping center took shape following in the wake of all those we have considered. Its ground floor houses the neighborhood's newest supermarket, one that again embodies all the promises and perils of this story. In the summer of 2017, Harlem got its first Whole Foods. And behind you on the land that has been my focus today, one can find yet another skyscraper rising right between Harlem Center and the state office building. This will be the Urban League Empowerment Center, the new, the new, the new headquarters of the National Urban League, which top, don't worry, I'm not gonna say anything bad, which topped off in September and which carries forward so many of the themes embedded in this land. Developed and owned by one of the nation's famed civil rights organizations, 
the complex's backers echo the self-determination voiced at reclamation site number one. As Urban League President Mark Morial explained, quote, it will be black owned, we are not a tenant, unquote. Yet so too does it echo the commercial development that became central to the idea of community development here. The final development will include offices, housing, and Harlem's first target and Trader Joe's. The complex will also include a civil rights museum, New York City's first, when it opens in 2025. What remains to be seen is which story of Harlem it will tell, which vision of racial empowerment here it will relate. The radical one of 1969, the moderate one of 1979, the politically pragmatic one of 1999, or the interwoven and often paradoxical history that ultimately shaped this site and which shaped this famed neighborhood too in these crucial decades. Thank you. And I look forward to our conversation um, and your questions. Thank you, um, Brian. Um, we customarily allow you to questions. I'd love to, yeah. Okay. And I would also take comments if you, especially are thinking about reparations. I was trying to think of it through the lens of this as I was as I was um, preparing. So you know, it's something that I would I would be glad to learn from you as well as um, pon you know ponder on with you. Yes, in okay. third row. I am the uh, recently retired president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh. And I used to work for the National Urban League and the Youth Work Urban League, had offices on the 125th. And of course, I'm aware that we are building our national headquarters. I'll go back to it. And so, Mark Morial has been pursuing this for decades, and all of the politics involved in Albany and how many business leaders on the National Urban League Board that has um, come to play in this, in DC, et cetera. I would love for you to just comment on what you know about the establishment of this. Um, potentially less than you, although we can see if we together, maybe you can put our heads together and, and see where you end up. But what I do know is, um, that this was not necessarily foreordained for Harlem. It was, I think that they, you know, were always very interested in being in Harlem. Um, and so that was kind of a, a real success in a lot of ways. And I, you know, I, I don't, um, I try not to waffle in, in my analysis, but I think it is important for us to understand that new life is actually often more nuanced than it is black and white. And, you know, as much as we live in a world that likes things to be polarized, things are actually more complicated. So, you know, the fact that, um, this development can be easily seen as part of a story of commercial development on 125th Street. And I saw the building and construction uh, in the fall. It's huge, you know, it's big, and it's part of a larger expansion of the scale of 125th Street. At the same time, it's amazing, right, that this building is sitting here. Um, and I think we can recognize both things as being true. I do know that this is a plot, as you probably gathered from the, from the presentation today, that has remained state-owned land. Um, and basically, there was a kind of strip of, um, I think there was a parking garage and a strip of stores that were always kind of a, a what we would call it urban history, like a taxpayer, you know, basically just keeping the land uh, um, find, funded um, for years. And so I believe that having it be state-owned land was what made it possible. And I think, you know, um, the governors obviously being Democrats also helped a lot. One thing I'll say, um, which is interesting is, when the state initially decided to build a state office building in Harlem, that came about because they had um, decided to build the World Trade Centers, which you all know. And uh, civil rights leaders, especially Whitney Young, who was the head of the National Urban League, a moderate, although a really interesting person, and a really interesting person, I should say, um, he actually said, you know, you need to build 
uh, state building in Harlem too, why does downtown get all the benefits of the World Trade Center? And so the uh, state responded actually to the point of view of Harlem moderates. And so in a way, it's interesting that it comes full circle and that this building is in many ways, you know, it's it's the Urban Leagues project, um, which is what, you know, Whitney Young imagined in 1965 or whatever it was. So that's another kind of interesting, you know, circularity echoing of the history um, here. Beyond that, I know that the housing um, up top, uh, it, it, uh, I think all of it is considered affordable housing. I and mean, I don't need to tell all of you affordable housing is, you know, it's not a simple thing. It, you know, means it's pegged to a certain percentage of area median income. So it's it's affordable. I, I think based on the numbers, it's probably kind of moderate um, working, um, lower income folks, uh, not, you know, the lowest possible costs, but obviously they're trying to make the project work financially, which is the, the world that they live in. And I'm sure, you know, capitalism is, Professor Chatter said at the beginning is lurking, a main, you know, around all these things. And of course, people are still dealing in a world where um, profit is often the motivating um, uh, factor in how they make decisions. So I, please, yeah. Um, I wanted everybody to understand how Harlem is so centrally located in terms of transportation. Mm -hmm. If you live in Harlem, yeah. you can get anywhere at any time. It, it is the place to live. Yeah. And so it was also fought over because of its central location. That makes sense. And that's always been one of the great fears in the Harlem history is, you know, it's so easy to get to. That's why it's going to be taken over. Um, and as as you said, you know, there's basically two subway stops, you know, a five minute, a five foot walk away from this building. So, yeah, it's really centrally located. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Because it was a major player in making sure that Harlem was middle class um, and it didn't cater to the high the high incomes um, but it really helped a lot of young African-American families to be able to afford a brownstone mm -hmm. um, and to do what they need to do as far as building wealth for their families um, and so and, and in that sense um, it really and not it wasn't like uh, it wasn't like Pittsburgh, where people were interested in doing a lot of rental properties. Okay, um, similar to what we did in the South Bronx, they really made sure that people had houses that they owned their houses. All right, so that there could be an economic um, in, in the process. So I was glad that you mentioned them because I, I, I was in New York. I, I'm from New York originally, but I've been in Pittsburgh for about 22 years. Um, but um, I, what you said rang true. Um, I guess I, I guess it was interesting hearing how um, moderates were viewed. My father was in politics in New York. He died in office, he was in the office for four years. And um, he was considered one of the power brokers mm. in the state of New York. And um, what's not mentioned here is Harlem Hospital mm -hmm. and how Harlem Hospital was built and, and, and how it came to be. Um, and, um, you know, and how it was not just Democrat, but Republicans. It was a bipartisan effort in New York. Um, to get things done and get things up and running and to ensure that people had health care. Um, so I'm just, uh, and now we're looking at not just uh, capitalism, looking at jobs. Mm -hmm. People will be able to have jobs um, in the community if they so choose. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, and thanks for sharing your own experience there too. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Brian, thank you. I uh, really enjoyed uh, your talk. And uh, I'm like a good academic in training. I too have a comment. I love it. I visited New York City for the first time uh, two years ago and chose uh, to uh, stay in Holland. I spent a week there. Uh, on the face of it, it appears, uh, Holland, the place appears to be rather provincial. 
but one knows that it symbolizes both the highest achievements of and deprivation space by the African American. And in terms of pulling in affect and sentiments, Harlem did so on a global scale. Uh, on 125th Street, uh, where the bulk of the crop is situated, uh, lies Hotel Teresa, mm -hmm. yeah. called the Waldorf of Harlem, who in 1960, a year after Fidel Castro assumed power, uh, he was in New York City attending the UN General Assembly Summit. And uh, most hotels in New York wouldn't put him up. Uh, he uh, protested and uh, 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 threatened to pitch a tent and uh, spend the night at the Rose Garden, which is where the General Assembly is. And ultimately, he decided to uh, 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 book a room at Hotel Teresa which is where Malcolm X visited him. Uh, the Prime Minister of the country I came from, I come from, was the first head of state to visit him there too. And uh, Nikita Khrushchev then rings him up and says, okay, uh, uh, you know, I, I look forward to meeting you, uh, General Castro. And uh, the Cubans then say, well, okay, we come to the mission in Washington, D.C. And meet, uh, and meet you there formally. At that point, uh, the consulate in New York uh, that the Soviets had closed and it remained closed for three decades. But Khrushchev then says, wait, hang on, hang on. No, I need to come to Holland again to make a very pertinent political point. And so Khrushchev then comes to Harlem and meets him at uh, Hotel Teresa. And uh, there are these remarkable photographs that I think was published by the uh, uh, online edition of Smithsonian Magazine a few years ago, showing all of these heads of states and uh, uh, Malcolm X too. And the pictures are remarkable. So if anyone's interested, you should look them up. Yeah, and I, I, I thank you. And I, I will say one thing um, that, that kind of reminds us that um, Harlem actually does not continue to be the largest African-American community in New York City for most of the era of my book, but symbolically it remains the, the kind of most symbolically um, important. And there's, of course, um, both, things are, both things matter. And so um, as that story suggests, you know, the symbolic quality sometimes were um, ultimately the most important part of its, um, of its identity in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah, um, let me see, how, how about gentlemen over here? Um, thank you for your remark. One very important unresolved question um, and it's very important today is what does community control look like? You know, that's something everybody feels right on this. The other, and this one, other comment is that I would appreciate it if you were given the name of some of the actors, some of the sure. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Well, one thing I'll say in my defense is the um, radicals who took over the site actually did not want to be known. So they actually don't, um, they're, they're not easily identified. Although a gentleman came to me once at a book talk and said, you know, um, you know, James Cheney, who was one of the three young men murdered in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, his uh, the Mississippi burning story, his brother, Ben, who has his own complicated life after that, as you would imagine from something that tra traumatic, actually was one of the people on the site, which is super interesting. He's still alive. Um, you know, I haven't spoken with him, although I'd love to at some point. In terms of the... Um, uh, the moderate figures, well, I'd say in terms of the radical figures who were kind of important in this, um, not all of whom were resident at the site, um, Preston Wilcox, who was a, a you know, kind of an amazing uh, uh, voice of conscience in Harlem for decades, a, a radical who never really changed um, his stripes, and um, Alice Cornegue, who was a, a community leader in East Harlem, who actually was on the board of HGDC, which is complicated, but uh, as far as I can tell, you know, she wasn't the main figure. Um, in terms of the moderates, you know, certainly um, uh, people who were, um, uh, the names now are going to escape me, but the gentleman who was the head of the New York Amsterdam News would have been one of the kind of voices who got to have, Tate, J Joseph Tate, Bill Tatum, thank you. Yeah, so he was certainly in the, in the Harlem Urban Development Corporation group. Um, 
you're you're challenging my church memory in the moment. So I'll have to look at the book and tell you others. But the figures who had churches around 125th Street, many of them um, wanted projects kind of that they could be involved with. So they were also very involved in addition to people like Alice Cornegay. Um, and then certainly, you know, the Harlem Four, um, you know, Charlie Rangel, um, Percy Sutton, um, Basil Patterson, who was a little bit more in the radicals camp. He wasn't a radical, but he was more sympathetic to them, um, that group. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they did. Yeah, no, Harlem was exciting. All of these people did. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually the first African-American day parade, um, which he led when he walked by the site, it was occupied by the young radicals and he raised his fist in solidarity with them, which is really interesting, you know, kind of a reminder of who he, who he situated himself among, you know, he was quite sympathetic to that point of view. Yes, yeah, seven, no, seven, yeah. Yeah, I saw some hands in the back. Um, yes, here in the third row and then the fifth row. When I think of the word gentrification, it doesn't always spring to mind a pleasant situation, especially when I look at Pittsburgh and you know, what we have experienced at the time. Um, urban renewal of the hill really resulted in urban removal of yeah. a mass amount of people. You know, with no plans, you know, for where they were going to be placed, you know, so mass displacement of people, you know, and it just makes you sad in a way. So, you know, you don't, I don't look at it enthusiastically, um, especially in Pittsburgh, in the auxiliary section of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. where, you know, all these corporations come in, but they don't have a plan. So you don't have a plan for the people who have been there for generations. You know, it's it's a heartless move to me. I mean, you've got your your Starbucks and all of these, the Whole Foods, you know, um, Trader Joe's, you know, but no, nobody really seems to take part, you know, the history of folks who have, have been. And so, you know, when I drive through these communities now, you know, it's, you know, you're, you're missing an element, a very important element of the history of Pittsburgh. And that's people who do. And so um, my question to you is when you were doing your research on gentrification in Harlem, and by the way, I was in Harlem for a year, you know, moved there to be with my daughter who had just a baby. And I would visit Harlem, I would go to Marvin Samuelson, you know, Red Rooster mm -hmm. restaurant. And I just marveled at the changes, you know, that I saw, you know, had come into place. And, I mean, I, I was just amazed. I was there many years ago when, you know, you would go to the bar and you'd see all of these wonderful things like street vendors. I could buy wonderful art. And, and that element is no longer there. That was a characteristic, mm -hmm. you know, to me, you know, because, and then this this feeling of despair sort of rises in you, you know, and say, wow, you know, some things are just important. Some things don't mean anything, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're making changes and in making a part of the city beautiful, then you're planning. You need to plan for people who were there not to remove them to the, you know, the perimeters of the, you know, the city, move them out to the suburbs or whatever, and find housing for them out there where they can't get to their jobs, you know, and the transportation is really difficult. You know, so I mean, what did you find in your research? If you could speak on that. Sure. Thing. Yeah. No, I I mean your point of view, I agree with I think certainly you know understanding the value of neighborhoods and their history and the people who made up those neighborhoods is, is of course why neighborhoods are wonderful and why people are able to make and enjoy lives there I often think of um, this story as kind of a, a train you know that I really want people to understand that the the motive force of the train was not uh, a they and it wasn't uh, you know a that it was often actually a vision by people who inhabited this space um, but like a train, you know, once it gets going, it can be very difficult to stop. And, you know, Red Rooster is actually not a bad example. You know, Red Rooster is owned by a, a person of color and a, 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 who identifies closely with Harlem and loves what Harlem means. He's also, you know, a celebrity chef. Um, he lives there, but he's opened a restaurant that is supposed to, you know, ideally bring in certain kinds of people. Um, it's a wonderfully diverse restaurant, but it's certainly a restaurant that's expensive. 
Um, and in a way, it's a metaphor for, I think, a larger story of Harlem, which is that it's easy enough to say, you know, we need more middle income people, we need a supermarket, we need a Trader Joe's, we need to be able to buy records and clothes in our, in our neighborhood. But once the train starts moving in a market economy where real estate is not controlled, you know, by the state, it's very easy for things to slip out of control. And that is something that's happened here. And I will say, uh, Calvin Butts is a wonderful person who did a lot for Harlem. Uh, this path mark is not there anymore. Abyssinian developed it with a group that had much more radical roots than Abyssinian. And Abyssinian sold it to one of the largest real estate developers in New York City in 2014 without permission from the other group or from the city. And that was the start of a series of land deals that Abyssinian embarked on that were uh, both a kind of rapid selling of property that was supposed to be community beneficial and also a lot of taking on a lot of debt that was of kind of somewhat mysterious origins. And so I do think we should be careful and understand that, you know, people change over time and sometimes they make bad choices. And in this case, you know, this is going to become, uh, I think, a 15 story building, um, an office building, I believe. Um, with a, a gourmet grocery store on the first floor. And Pathmark is a supermarket, but Pathmark's not an expensive supermarket. So, you know, it is worth asking, like, why does this community development corporation sell a Pathmark to Extel, which is, you know, the same real estate developer that's building, you know, a super tall tower on 53rd Street. And um, just a reminder that the as the train gets moving quickly, um, there's also um, some culpability of people who are part of the story too. It's not just, you know, the X tells, it's also the, the community organizations that are involved in the same deals. Um, there is housing that is considered affordable, but not, um, you know, not enough for every single person who wants to stay there. And I think there's also something you said, as as you indicate, you know, for the family that owns the brownstone and says, you know, let's sell, make a few million dollars and have a nest egg that people can live on for a long time and generations. So that is something that white people have been allowed to do for a long time. And of course, black people should be allowed to do that, too. So there there's always um, nuance to these things. Um, I'm, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask, because the gentleman in the fifth row has been very patient, so go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to give us a little bit of a free look, I guess, what you are already working on with respect to how the figure of the architect sure. has bonded or understood in the transition from a more radically democratic moment to one that was more developer-oriented. Yeah. So, I just figure it makes sense to affect you. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a hard one. And I don't know if I am good at answering it yet. But one thing I'll say that this project, I hope, evinces events, events to all of you is that I'm really interested in um, how one of the really transformative movements of the 20th century, which is the civil rights movement, the most transformative movement of the 20th century, um, somehow like kind of was just not discussed in the history of architecture and really not that much in the history of planning either for a long time. Um, but, you know, we know that it changed so much and surely it changed uh, those things too. And so, one of the interests I have in Max Bond is that he was a person, as the title of the book indicates, if architecture were for people, that was a quote he had, who was very concerned with the idea that architecture often was not for people, and, and the, also the idea that it could be for people, um, a notion of architecture as a kind of tool in the struggle for civil rights and what it meant to build an architecture that was, um, for him, his tool of rights seeking, of, of freedom dreaming, of kind of trying to make a more equal more just world. Uh, to, sim to answer simply your second question, Black architects work in the larger structure um, you know, of architects, but also in the larger structure in which Blackness unfolds. And for a Black architect, and the reason I'm interested in Black architects is they're a really niche group in a way. They're not a lot of them. They have to navigate two worlds that often don't talk to one another. Um, there are always outsiders, even for somebody like him who succeeded in a lot of ways that um, architects seek, he was still kind of always in the margins of the center. Um, and so he created his own firm in 1969, 68, as a kind of effort to realize some of these goals in the realm of professional practice. And it was always a struggle, you know, when the economy was poor um, and architects suffered, he always suffered more. Um, when um, the recession in the 80s came, 
um, essentially he had to make a choice, you know, whether to sort of continue to struggle on or to, to be a full-time academic or to join a larger majority white firm. And that was kind of part of a series of stories that, that unfolded at that time that mirrored that. And so to answer your question simply, you know, one person can't oppose that larger sort of turbulence of, of structure that they um, exist in. And in his case, it forced a lot of very difficult choices about what it means to be an architect. And in his case, meant doing bigger projects. And, you know, it's easy to see those as a loss. Although I think I would also argue, you know, that similar to the story, they represent a, a, a effort to deal with contingency, um, honestly, and often that meant making choices that were difficult and were not always fully realized one's idealistic dreams, but still were, were um, you know, efforts to do the best one could in the circumstances. So I don't know if that is a helpful answer, but that's kind of a, a chestnut, a, a nutshell answer um, for this point. So. Yeah, the, the, the bottom line is architecture um, is not enough to gain equal rights as what one would expect. And an architect seeking that goal often found frustration as much as they often found success. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, many are, and many, many uh, you know, some of the same organizations exist, um, and um, you know, Abyssinian is one of those. But there, this is a good moment to, I guess, plug an alternative, an interesting approach that is worth. I'm sure folks here have thought about them in the context of Pittsburgh. But you know, there are also efforts to create um, community land trusts in Harlem. There's one in East Harlem. Those are kind of an exciting. Um, strategy that I would probably um, align more with the sort of 60s effort of kind of how to, um, if not reform capitalism, how to carve out exceptions to capitalism um, that reflect um, community ownership. And that's certainly a different kind of idea than the idea of, um, you know, a lot of the um, 80s and 90s groups focused around um, LIHTC, the low income housing uh, tax um, credit which you know, was a means of financing that paired the public and the private and foundations. Um, community land trusts don't do that. You know, they're very based, based on the idea essentially that community will hold um, land ownership in common and make collective development decisions about that land. Um, as you might imagine, the scale that can achieve in a place like New York is limited because land is very costly, but it's exciting and it may be suggestive of something that could be a, a way forward that is like, like inclusionary zoning, it, it acknowledges that capitalism exists and you, can, you can't really stop it. So how can you sort of carve out moments where you can pause it or where you can create systems within it that can allow for more decision-making? So to be determined how successful that is. Has it worked well here? No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the same dilemma comes up with all of these kind of efforts and true of, of the art question about Max Bond too, which is that, you know, you need money to do this stuff and the money has to come from somewhere. And once you tie yourself to somebody else's horse, then you're, you know, you're subject to vulnerabilities that result from that. And that might mean, you know, that you're, subject to political change, or it might mean you're subject to recessions, but, you know, they don't have the autonomy of a JP Morgan Chase or somebody who has, you know, their own income generating abilities. And that's a, tr that's a problem. It limits things. Yeah, Professor Chuck. You know, we're working on a multi-year um, reparations project. And the question I think that you're grappling with are the resources we have to really deal with crafting uh, Reparations uh, agenda. Um, Labor historians, you know, have signed on in a real way, you know, to try to forge this reparations agenda. Economists, you know, um, who are uh, signing on. Uh, are architects signing on? I mean, architectural historians, do you see that category of, uh, of scholars and activists working? actively to forge a reparations agenda? It's an interesting question. I would probably say no, I don't, I don't think so. And I don't think it's, um, I don't think it would be for lack of 
of interest or or uh, common mind. I think um, it would be an interesting question to think about, and I'd love to talk with you more about this, you know how historians position themselves in that conversation. You know what's the role of history, right? We're we're good at sort of explaining what happened. We're not always as good at thinking of you know interventions or policy changes. Um, so that would be an interesting way. I mean, some of the repair in in architectural history is simply ensuring that, and this isn't necessarily repair as much is ensuring that histories actually reflect the people who are in the world, right? Not excluding groups of people who've simply been ignored. Um, but the broader question of kind of structural change, I wouldn't say is very present. I'd love to hear more from you, you know, maybe when we talk later about that. Okay, you, you responded to it on the, on the recommendation side. Sure. What you do? How about on making the case for recommendation? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I think I'd say there, yes, but not stated as that, as the agenda. But, you know, I think an effort to show the embeddedness of um, racism and racist structure in nearly every aspect of the built environment from, you know, buildings and where they're placed, the conversation around redlining, which is very present now in a way that no urban historian ever could have imagined, you know, eight years ago, six years ago, but also thinking about the ways that um, you know, white supremacy structures, things like architectural style, the way that it's embedded in building forms. That's a pretty present conversation among the group of architectural strains that I'm interested in. You know, what does it mean to build public buildings that are um, tied to histories of, of like Western, the idea of the ascendant Western civilization or the Greco-Roman past or the monuments conversation. You know, a lot of architectural strains are very engaged in the monuments conversation in showing, you know, in the case of somebody like um, Robert E. Lee, you know, the ways that Robert E. Lee's uh, statues were uh, sim symbols of physical domination, but also embodied ideas of uh, beauty that were um, derived directly from notions of white supremacy in the 19th century. And that is something that is more present in, in, my, uh, in that side of my disciplines. But I wouldn't say it's um, discussed in the context of reparations. It would be interesting to think about what it would mean to call it that, right? Rather than just to think about it as, as, as revealing these histories that are largely ignored. Yeah, and I'd love to talk with you more about that. Connected to uh, Dr. Trotter's question, your book, your title, when you say art protector, Black community, civil rights, they don't go together. It is not a usual topic. So I was extremely intrigued to see that an architect wanted to come in and talk about. Black folks' neighborhoods, uh, very seriously. So I'm curious, uh, and really tied this into what the doc, Dr. Carter was asking, what made you curious to tie civil rights, Black neighborhoods, et cetera, in together? Sure. I mean, a lot of it was that um, folks on the ground were having this conversation. You know, ur urban renewal was extremely disruptive in ways that were so tangible and were. Um, maybe not always in ways they realized, but they were directly tied to the kind of ascendant, like um, common theories of architecture at that moment, which is, you know, an idea of building modern buildings that were massive in scale and, you know, would span multiple blocks and that modern housing was the solution to the problem of the city. All these things, of course, people on the ground, you know, they noticed it because it was next to them or on, on top of them. Um, but uh, the same conversation was happening in urban planning and architecture circles, you know, and, and in ways that are really hard, I think, for us to sort of sympathize with, and we don't need to sympathize with them, but should at least try to understand that this, in many ways, comes out of uh, an idea that modern architecture could cure all these problems, you know, of the city, that the city was messy and, you know, needed modern housing, and if we build housing well in massive numbers, we'll solve these problems, of course, the policy behind that completely falls apart very quickly because of all of the same dynamics that we know are common in American history, right? Like the debate about whether the government should be uh, supporting its resident, you know, its um, its citizens, you know, who gets public money, all these all these things, which we saw with you know the healthcare fight recently, more recently, so you can imagine it. But um, that is one of the reasons I was really interested in it was, you know, the the fight over urban renewal was a fight about policy, and it was a fight about, um, you know 
mayors, but it was also a fight about architecture and about the role of architecture and what a city should look like and who should decide. Um, and architecture also, the second part answer is that architecture is a, is, a, is a future imagining discipline in a way that a lot of other disciplines aren't, right? Like an architect draws something on a board in order to build it. So they're imagining a future. And just like an architect can do that, uh, a, a citizen can do that. And in the 60s, there's this whole movement that I got really interested in where architects and planners were saying, you know, the problem in a place like Harlem isn't that people don't don't have ideas about what they want, and it isn't, um, you know, that they can't think architecturally. It's that they don't have the they don't have the skills that a city a council will listen to. So let's open a storefront in Harlem, let's volunteer, and let's be their architects. And there's this really it's called advocacy planning or advocacy architecture, radical architecture. There's this whole movement that I write about a lot in the book where all these um, architects, first white and black, and then eventually just sort of people folks who are aligned with the black power point of view um, said, you know, let's create these things called community design centers where we can provide design services for community like Harlem so that they don't walk into a meeting and say, we don't want that. They walk into a meeting and say, we don't want that, we want this. And if you can say, we want this, then you can have the grounds of a conversation, right? Two, it's uh, the idea being, that if you have two plans on the table, a conversation can unfold. And if you just say no, then oftentimes, you know, the debate stops. So those are a couple of the reasons why I got really interested in this. And then the other reason, just black architects, as I said before, is really interesting group of people. Like uh, still up to this day, roughly two, 3% of architects are African-American and the number was much lower then. So, you know, black professionals were going into medicine, they were going into law, um, they were, you know, going into religion but there weren't a lot of black professionals going into architecture. Um, and so I'm really interested in that. And that would be the third answer. Okay. Um, I know we're almost out of time. Yeah. But look, um, Jay Max Bond, uh, say a word about how he reinforced or challenged mainstream architecture. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think um, I've been thinking a lot about as a kind of argumentative thread is the um, discourse around urban renewal a lot of it has been um, kind of discussed in in the um, outcome as like modernism, modern architecture was um, a white supremacist architecture that was intent on dominating black people in its use. And I think that often was true, but uh, Max Bond was educated in a modernist tradition. And the thing about modernism that was inspiring when it emerged was this idea that uh, that a better world was possible, that, that architecture could build a better world. And I think what Max Bond really said, instead of saying like modernism is bad, I think he said, you know, this idea of building a better world, why, let, instead of abandoning that, let's hold that to the prom, to the demands of, for racial justice and say, you know, how can we press the demands of the civil rights movement on this idea of building a better world? And so one thing that I'm really interested in is the way that kind of even, um, something that emerges in his own, in his parents' generation is this idea of a civil rights modernism, this idea of a modernism that belonged to black people too. The idea that uh, kind of utopian thinking, um, building the world anew was something that um, belonged to people in the struggle for racial justice. And that for him, I think he was really trying to shape a civil rights modernism, a modernism that was uh, focused on those kinds of ideas, um, you know, that that the city could be both modern and more just, um, that he didn't see those as as um, as opposed. Maybe we'll bring you back for the moment. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it very much. Wonderful questions and comments. Your engagement means much. Thank you. Thank you.